And I'm sure many of you in this room know who Liz Garbus is because uh, she's a prolific documentary filmmaker. We've shown many of her films here, including The Farm, Bobby Fischer, Against the World, What Happened, Miss Simone. Um, and it is always wonderful having her here, but it, what is most special about this year is that she has directed her first fiction film. Um, and it is a powerful and affecting one, and I, um, I think you're all going to really like it. Um, I'm so glad to be able to introduce to you today the director of Lost Girls, Liz Garbus. thrilled to be here at Sundance. Um, it's my happiest place, and it means so much that you guys, um, Kim and Cooper, invited the film. Um, and I'm so grateful to you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk for a long time, because at the end, I will introduce a whole bunch of incredible people who made this film possible, but I will just say a few quick things. Um, I want to thank Netflix, uh, Ted Sarandos, Lisa Nishimura, Ian Brick, and Mandy Becker, Beck, Beckner, who came on board on this film after I'd been pushing this boulder up the hill for many, many years, and then they just were the wind at my back and the express train to the finish. And I thank you, Netflix, for always having my back. Um, so um, I'm just gonna say thank you a few people. You'll meet the cast, some of the cast and crew at the end. Just wanna give a shout out to my agent, Christina Bezdikas, who found this incredible script by Michael Worley. And without her, we wouldn't be here today. Um, Team Langley Park, Kevin McCormick, Rari Coslow, David Kennedy, and Archer Gray, who, like, who needs Marvel superheroes when you have Ann Carey, the producer. Um, and my husband, Dan Kogan, and my two children, Amelia and Theo, whose preciousness has not only filled my life with light, but also has taught me how much is always at stake. Um, enjoy Lost Girls. Thank you. I wanted to introduce um, the folks who made this movie possible. Um, please welcome Amy Ryan. Congratulations to all of you. Um, an incredible job that you, you all did. Actually, can I get you all to hit that blue line there? Thank you. Um, before, Liz, before I open it up to the audience, I just wanted to ask you um, a question about why it was, uh, I think this is a really stirring film about women and girls, um, and why was it important to you to make this film? Um, well, Bob Kolker wrote this incredible book, Lost Girls, which um, with kind of forensic detail chronicled the lives and families who um, suffered losses in the Gilgo Beach murders. Um, and each one of them was so specific and so viciously <laughs> alive in their lives. And um, they had been reduced to, um, you know, the word prostitute and, um, you know, tossed casually on the side of the road, not even covered up very well as if, 
it wasn't, and no one was really gonna look for them. And Mary Gilbert um, wasn't listened to and she raised her voice. And as she continued to raise it, people started to listen. Um, and she suffered a tragic end and um, the film honors her memory and the memory of badass woman who won't take no for an answer. Um, and, um, and of course, we hope that there's some justice and that this film um, propels the conversation forward about this, this case. Okay. Am I pro-criminalization? No, I'm not pro-criminalization. Oh, am I pro-decriminalization? I am. I mean, I don't know. Does anyone else want to tackle this question? Bob? I mean, it's simple for me. I am, but I always was. So maybe there are I don't, I, other folks. I mean, in fact, you're right. It's not isolated. Um, women who work in the sex industry are very, very vulnerable. Um, the character that Lola Kirk plays, Kim, um, we had the opportunity to show these women the film, and they said, you know, for her, in her mind, it was like, part of this is, is about how do you keep safe while you're, while you're doing this work. Um, and, I, and, and clearly, they're ideal victims um, in many, many ways. So yes, I, I think that treating them as full citizens as opposed to criminals would help. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about that? I've been involved with many other things, and I'm just curious if you were aware of it, and why you wow. didn't at least insist? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. Can I, can I say something? Wait, 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 before, I'm gonna just do a tiny bit of a preamble. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy Burke, some of these characters, like Dean's characters, were com based on composites so, yeah. of, of real people in the police department. You can understand there are complications with that, but go ahead, Dean. Yeah, I mean, my, my character in the film is the only person who's not based on a real person, but a composite. Jimmy Burke was the main, he was the main guy. Um, you know, Jimmy Burke is, you know, at the time he was voted the most corrupt cop in the United States. And the Suffolk County Police Department was more corrupt than any police department in any major city. And ironically, it's in a gated community area where mansions are in Long Island. So it's like a very, it's a very, you know, it was a very tough thing. We, we didn't want to go and call me Jimmy Burke. Uh, there's, there's a lot of legal reasons. And of course, there, there, there's a blue line. You know, don't forget, he's a cop and cops. You know, I, when, when I first got this job, I went and I rode around with the original detectives uh, in the SCPD who were on this case. And, you know, I, they, they gave me all the stories about Jimmy Burke. And I, you know, selfishly, I kind of wanted to go down that road, but it was a smart thing that we didn't do that. So I think, you know, the composite of the, of the characters works better than that. But I, I know what you're saying. And, the, you know, the guys that, you know, the FBI came in, the government came in, you know, the, the whole thing was a, a mess. But don't forget, there's that, there's that blue, that, there's that blue line. So. And and please, please don't call them prostitutes. Yeah. Oh yes. Right. Well, I, I, I think we're hoping there is a second act. I think that's. Love to make this evil. <laughs> I, I tried to keep it ambiguous, just because it is ambiguous. And uh, it comes off very badly, I think. <laughs> I think he's guilty, but uh, when we were doing it, I, I, I really tried to have him be terrifying, but not necessarily the guy. Uh, he's around, he's still alive. And uh, I imagine when this movie comes out, we might hear from him. <laughs> from, you know, write your letters, write your local congressman. He's in Florida. <laughs> this is the wonderful Reed Burney. Mary Gilbert believed, and I had a chance to spend time with Mary Gilbert um, during the process of developing this, you know, working with Michael on the script and um, getting this project off the ground. But you know, she, that was her, this, this, this film is really told through her point of view, and that was her firm belief. Obviously, it's very complicated. There are a lot of questions about the police, about conspiracies. We don't know the answer, so these, in the hands of these talented actors, we wanted you to ask those questions and have those questions for yourself. Excellent. <laughs> I, I want to say one more thing, uh, just an addendum to what we were talking about. When I rode around with the SCPD, I rode, I, I rode around with the lead detective and his wife. They, they, were, they were the first detectives on it. And, and I ended up spending time with uh, four more. And, they, and they, are, they all know who did this. I mean, they all say, we know who did this. 
you know, and I think the theory is, is that it's probably this guy over here. If, you know, not, not Reed, not, not, not Reed. But, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, that, if that's because they were covering their bases, but they were adamant about, they knew who it was, they just could not find that extra piece of tie together. We lost it. Yes, a question here. First, I just want to say, anytime I say Miriam Shore in a movie, I'm so excited. I love it. Yay! Wow. You really earned that 20 bucks I gave you. Thank you. <laughs> and also, Liz, can you talk a little bit about hiring a female composer and what the work was with Anne and how she structured the score, please? Oh, she's a female? She is. Oh, yeah. Um, Anne Nicotin is just Love so <laughs> um, I try to hire a lot of women. Um, I think they are really good. And, um, and, 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 and I like men too. But um, Anne is just, you know, she's a genius. And um, I was sent her, actually, yeah, I, I was sent her um, scores on other films. And we just, Camilla and I just kept using them in the movie. Um, <laughs> unlicensed. And then we're like, you know, this is our lady. So, um, yeah, it was an easy, an easy choice. And we were thrilled that Anne wanted to come aboard. Yeah. I read the script, I loved it, I spoke to you, we had early conversations and we felt like we were on the same page musically and so yeah and then that was it. I came to spot with you and we had a really great meeting and then I started writing and developing that. Hey this is Eric from MyOnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.